Well, people of God, let me invite you to turn now in your copy of God's Word uh, to Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9, as we make our way through this book uh, of Genesis. And in your pew Bible, you should be able to find that on page 8. Page 8. Last couple of weeks, we of course have been looking at the flood narrative, God's calling of Noah. Last week, we looked at chapters 7 through 8 in the flood in its entirety. And now, uh, chapter 9, we're going to be looking at how God recreates what he has destroyed, how he makes a covenant with Noah. As we're going to see in a moment, this is a covenant that is, of course, still in play to this day until Christ comes back. Uh, But we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 17. And so I remind you, this is God's living and inspired word. Genesis 9, verse 1. Then God blessed Noah and his sons, saying to them, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. The fear and dread of you will fall upon all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the air, upon every creature that moves along the ground, upon all the fish of the sea, they are given into your hands. Everything that lives and moves will be food for you, Just as I gave you the green plants, I now give you everything. But you must not eat meat that has its lifeblood still in it. And for your lifeblood, I will surely demand an accounting. I will demand an accounting from every animal and from each man too. I will demand an accounting for the life of his fellow man. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed." For in the image of God has God made man. As for you, be fruitful and increase in number, multiply on the earth and increase upon it. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, I now establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you, and with every living creature that was with you, the birds, the livestock, and all the wild animals, all those that came out of the ark with you, every living creature on the earth. I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be cut off by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, this is the sign of the covenant I am making between me and you, and every living creature with you, a covenant for all generations to come. I have set my rainbow in the clouds, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Whenever I bring clouds over the earth and the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all the living creatures of every kind. Never again will the waters become a flood to destroy all life. Whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures of every kind on the earth. So God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant I have established between me and all life on the earth. And there ends the reading of God's holy word. And as always, we are dependent on God the Holy Spirit now to bless the preaching of this word. Let's pray for his presence at this time. Our great God and our Father, we thank you that you have called us into your presence. We thank you that you have assembled us with the saints who have gone before us in heaven and the angels gathered around your throne, even now singing praises unto you who are worthy. Our Father, we pray now that you'd be with us. Father, we stand in need of your word to bless our hearts this morning. Father, we pray that you would speak very personally to each of us. We pray that you would open up this word, not only that we'd understand it intellectually, but Father, that we'd understand it personally. Send your spirit that he would apply uh, this word unto us our hearts. And we do ask this in Christ's name alone. Amen. Well, as many of you know, I spent a number of years working in construction with my dad, and as I think back on it, there were numerous times where we would make mistakes. Uh, If you've ever had to build a wall or maybe assemble a cabinet, you know that you can mismeasure something or assemble something wrong, and the only thing you can do at the end of the day is break out your hammer and your crowbar and tear that wall apart or tear the cabinet apart. And uh, there were numerous times where we had to do this. Uh, We had to tear the nails out, we had to pry the boards apart, and then we had to correct our mistake, X out all the old pencil marks, and and try to put the the wall together, the cabinet together the right way. And 
Again, if you've ever had to do that, you know it's more complicated the second time around. Uh, you have the old pencil marks that you have to try to ignore, and you have to try the new, pencil, find the new pencil marks to make sure you're putting the stud right exactly where it's supposed to go. And not only that, you often have the nail holes of the previous uh, attempt to deal with, and, and everything is a little more complicated. In fact, usually when we had to do this, my dad would be the one to assemble it because he wanted to make absolutely sure we didn't repeat the same mistake and we got it right the second time. Well, I think this text this morning gets a little bit at that. God has tore apart his creation. As we saw last week, he completely dissembled it. He brought it back to the watery chaos of Genesis chapter 1. And now as we come to Genesis chapter 9, he's redoing it. He's remaking it. But like a a wall that had to be teared apart, has all the old pencil marks on it, as we come to chapter 9, the new creation after the flood has the old marks of sin and corruption still in it. As God begins to rebuild and to give a second Adam through Noah, there's a sense in which it's not like the first time around. There are the marks and the remnants of what went before the flood still in creation. And so as we come to the text, the reason we see this is because God gives stipulations and changes to the mandate to Noah that were not there in the beginning. Uh, God is showing that there is still sin in man's heart. As we saw last week, Noah brought sin with his family through the water, and so sin is still a problem. And the sin of violence is still a problem, and so God will give protection and and, uh, provisions for how to deal with that. And in the end, God once again promises that he will never do the flood again. We see nothing here but sheer grace to a sinful people. And so the point is, God rebuilds and he gives new rules or changes to the rules in order to prevent full-scale evil as before. Now, really what we need to understand is, as we saw last week as we ended, the sin problem cannot be removed by removing wicked people from the earth. That's part of the point here. You can remove all the wickedness from the earth, and yet if you still have sin abiding in your heart, we still have a problem. So the whole point here is to drive home the reason God covenants not to destroy the world again is because it will not solve the sin problem. It points us immediately to the only one, the only place we can find forgiveness, and that is through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's, our, that's part of our theme this morning. This is what I want to show you with God's help. God restarts the world with stipulations to preserve and to promote life. He restarts the world with stipulations to preserve and promote life. And there are three things about the restart uh, that I want to show you. First of all, notice the restart with creation. How mankind and animals now uh, live together, but there's a difference. Secondly, notice the restart with the curse. God actually gives a stipulation here for capital punishment because of the, the corruption of man's heart. And then thirdly, the restart with the covenant. Uh, we need to understand what the covenant is and why it's significant. So creation, curse, and then covenant, and how God restarts the creation. So first of all, then know with me how God restarts with creation. If you look at verse 1, we see again that he begins just like Adam with a blessing. Look at verse 1. Then God blessed Noah and his sons, saying to them, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. Now, if you've been with us from the very beginning of our study, this should sound familiar because in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, God blessed Adam and he blessed Noah with the very same words. And we need to understand that a blessing is nothing more than God really saying, I will be for you. I will bless you. You will see my blessing in your life as I am your God and you are my people. Essentially, it's his promise of grace and care for them. But again, notice the mandate. Just as God mandated to be fruitful and multiply to the first Adam, so also with Noah. On the other side of the fall and on the other side of the flood, to Noah, God now reaffirms the mandate he gave to Adam before the fall. He says to Noah and his sons, be fruitful and multiply. I want you to fill the earth. I want you to spread over it. I want you to multiply. And you notice that this is a huge emphasis for God. In verse 7, it almost bookends this section here. God repeats it. He says, as for you, be fruitful and increase in number, multiply on the earth, and increase upon it. 
In other words, God is stressing that this is still in play. Despite the fact that there's still sin, despite the fact, as we saw from chapter 3, that, that there's frustration to the, the marriage relationship between a husband and a wife, God is saying, despite all of that, your mission, my mandate for you as my image bearers is to be fruitful, to multiply, to spread over the globe as my people. Now, a couple of things to note here. Again, this is revealing to us, really, Noah as a second Adam, the restart of the mandate. But the other thing I want you to notice, or just to ponder with me, is that this reveals that even after the fall and even after the flood, God's mandate to us is still to be fruitful and multiply. It is His intent to bless us, and part of that blessing is for the offspring and for children to marry couples. And I just say that this morning just to show and just to highlight that this is in many ways, is it not true, contrary to our modern culture. On the last 20 or so years, maybe even longer, a lot of our culture's teaching as it pertains to children and family is that, well, children are bothersome. Uh, Children are expensive. And if you're going to have children, don't have too many because it's going to take your joy from you. And the Bible says the exact opposite. If you are blessed to have children, that is part of the mandate that God has given to us in this creation covenant, that His intent for us in this day and age is still to be fruitful, to still multiply, and to still spread over the face of the globe. I mean, more than that, the reason I want to highlight this is because I don't even know when it started, the last 20, 30, whatever years, there's always been this teaching in secular culture that we're going to overpopulate the planet. In fact, a couple weeks ago, I read about China. If you know anything about China, they've limited how many children you can have, and they've cracked down on this, and just now they're realizing the foolishness of man. They don't have a second generation to support the older generation. So now they're extending the limit to three. You see, when mankind thinks they can control all things against God's wisdom, God is the one who shows, who truly knows what is wise. And so the point is, to this day, it is God's will for us to be fruitful and multiply. And even in the midst of a culture who would look down on that, we find God's blessing there. Now notice, as we go on, notice how we restart the creation with a new dominion mandate. Look at verse 2. It says, The fear and the dread of you will fall upon all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the air, upon every creature that moves along the ground, and upon all the fish of the sea. They are given into your hands. Now again, if you have your Bible open, you can turn to chapter 2 and compare and contrast this mandate with creation with what God gave to Adam. Uh, The first thing we notice is that just as pre-fall, mankind is still to rule over creation. Just as God said to Adam, you are to have dominion, you are to rule on my behalf, so also God is saying that to Noah. But notice the difference. To Adam, he had harmony with the animals. They would walk before him and he would name them. But now after the fall, God says there's going to be a difference. As you rule over creation, there's going to be a frustration that I'm going to bring between you and the animals. And that frustration is this. There's going to be a fear and a dread. And there's going to be almost as a a barrier between mankind and the animals you are to rule over. Uh, We know this. If you're a deer hunter or you walk in the woods, the moment you stumble upon a deer or they hear a twig from your foot break, they immediately bolt. Why? Because there's a fear now between the the creatures that God has given us to rule over. Uh, There's a dread of mankind. And part of the point is this. It's a reminder of the curse-filled world we are living in. One commentator noted, I'm not sure one way or the other on this, I think it's a possibility, but he noted that it's possible that God did this for our protection. Uh, He argued that even predatory animals like bears and cougars uh, have a level of fear, and so he argues that that maybe God did this to protect mankind from meat-eating animals. Uh, You can judge for yourself whether that's true or not. So there's a frustration with our dominion. Notice, thirdly, about creation. There's a new provision for food. Look at verse 3. Everything that lives and moves will be food for you, just as I give you the green plants, and I'll give you everything. But you must not eat meat that has its lifeblood still in it. Again, if you turn to Genesis chapter 1 and 2, God's mandate there was to give all the green plants, all the fruit to Adam. And so before this point, the mandate was to only eat the plants. And now God says on the other side of the flood, listen, I'm now going to expand your diet. You are now free to consume meat. 
I'm now saying that even the animals that run across the ground, you are free to hunt them, you are free to pursue them and to consume them for your sustaining good. The only restriction you notice, and God's Mosaic law will add to this clarification, is you're not to eat meat that still has its blood in it. Uh, behind this is you're not to eat meat like the animals do. Uh, you're to have a dignity to how you consume living animals. And the Bible draws this picture about life coming from the blood within. And so God is saying, listen, there's a dignity to how you consume it. You are to drain it. You're not to have uh, the blood in the meat. Now, some argue, and again, I leave this up to your own opinion on this, some argue that after the flood, a change happened in creation where plants were not enough to sustain us, and that's the reason for this. I don't know one way or the other whether that's true or not, but this is true. God has said, I'm giving you meat to eat. And so for the hunters among us this morning, this is good news. Hunting season is just around the corner. You should not feel guilty about sitting in your tree stand and taking uh, and harvesting a deer. It's God's gift to you, and in fact, even as I read uh, this week, I was reminded there seems to be a growing movement in the church of some people arguing that vegetarianism is more holy. Now, let me just say this morning, if that's your choice to be vegetarian, you're free to do that, but you're not allowed to say it's more holy. Because God here in Genesis 9 has said, I am giving you meat for your good. And so God now provides for his people by giving more food for them to consume. But here's the point. Noah and his descendants have dominion, but there's a change. There's a fear to it. There's a difference. There's a frustration. It's a new world, but there's still sin in it. There's still the remnants of the fall. Now, notice secondly how God restarts with the curse. Notice how God accounts for violence in the heart of fallen man. Look at verse 5. He says, And for your lifeblood I will surely demand an accounting. I will demand an accounting from every animal, and from each man too. I will demand an accounting for the life of his fellow man. Now, we need to back up a minute. Why does God suddenly turn to violence? Why does God suddenly turn to the horrific act of murder? Well, if you remember from chapter 6, what was the, the main thing, the main attribute of creation that God flooded the world for? It was violence. It's because mankind had grown so evil that when God looked down on it, he saw violence on the face of the earth, and it was that, the telltale sign, that wicked men had become so corrupt that God said, enough, I need to wipe you from the face of the earth. And now God, on the other side of the flood, says, listen, you brought your sin with you through the flood. I know that generations will come, and that same violent tendency will still be a part of fallen man's life. And so here I'm going to draw a distinction. There will be severe punishment for any who were to have a violent attitude and violent acts against your fellow man. Now, I want you to notice this. This is, whenever I talk about this topic, it's always a little controversial and difficult, but I want you to notice something here. Who is it that's demanding this? Notice the repetition. Three times in the text, God says, I require this. It's almost as if God is saying, listen, I don't want you to miss this. I am demanding that if anyone takes the life of another human being in cold blood, I, I, the supreme God of heaven and earth, I require an accounting for what they have done. In other words, I'm just pointing out this. This is not a man-made law. This is not human wisdom throughout history that has come up with the idea of capital punishment. It begins with God. God demands this accounting. And I think it's important to note the shift when we looked at Cain murdering Abel. God did not punish him with the death penalty, but allowed him to live. The same with Lamech. Lamech was allowed to murder and allowed to continue to live, and God says enough of that. That led to the need of the flood. From here on out, I'm requiring severe punishment for anyone who would murder. Now, notice the consequence here. Verse 6. God says, whoever sheds the blood of man, notice this, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God has God made man. Now here it says that this punishment that God is bringing about is for the human being who sheds the blood of his man. If you have your Bibles open, if you look at verse 5, there's emphasis here on shedding the blood of your fellow man, your brother. In other words, God is saying this is not for accidental killing. This is for those cold-blooded acts of what we call in our modern day a first-degree murder. 
This is not the accident on the highway. This is where you pick up an instrument and you take the life of someone else. God says, when it's cold-blooded, that's when this comes into play. In fact, actually, the Mosaic Law, if you, uh, in your own time, want to read it this afternoon, look at Exodus chapter 21. In Exodus 21, God gives case-by-case rules for who is to be put to death and for what reasons And even more than that, later on, he will give the rule for how to have a fair and just trial to make sure that a true murderer really is rightly judged. But here's the point. Uh, God is saying that for anyone who would murder his fellow brother, there is a high punishment for that. What is the punishment? Again, look at verse 6. By man shall his blood be shed. Who is the one who God is requiring to enact this judgment? It is the fellow man who's called by God, by called by his government, whoever it is, commissioned for the task of shedding the blood of the man who is the murderer. God requires fellow mankind to take into account and enact the punishment, capital punishment, over their fellow murderer, over their brother who committed the murder. And so here's the point. After the fall, the sin of murder still abides in the heart, and God now sets the highest standard, the highest penalty, in order to drive home how serious murder is. And in fact, I think there's some truth to this. One commentator noted that by the fact that God requires a fellow human being to take the life of the murderer, it's meant to highlight the seriousness. So that there's a shock factor to when this is rightly carried out. Now, notice the reason for the consequence. And this is so important. Why does God do this? What is the reason that God calls for this? Well, look again at verse 6, the very end. It says, for or because in the image of God has God made man. Why does God require this? God requires this because mankind, even after the fall, are still image bearers. To this day, we as sinners are broken image bearers, but image bearers nonetheless. And God, who has created us to reflect and, and to show forth his dignity, when someone is murdered, God says, I'm offended. It is my image that's been tarnished. It is my creation, and therefore I require, since my image has been tarnished, that that murderer face the death penalty for what they had done. In other words, God is deeply offended by cold-blooded murder, and even more than that, God is showing the dignity of being a human being. God says, you matter. Why? You're in my image. And when someone snuffs out your life, nothing less than the highest penalty uh, will meet uh, the crime. I think there's another reason in our text as well. And again, look at verse 7. We read it earlier, but God repeats again the call to be fruitful and to multiply. In other words, I think here's the point. God's mandate is to be fruitful, to multiply. Murder is the exact opposite of the mandate. In other words, God is giving this punishment to drive home the point. I'm calling for life. I'm calling for fruitfulness. Murder is the exact opposite of what I've called you to do. Therefore, capital punishment must be used in these cases. And and I would just point out here, this teaches us who our God is. God is a God of life. Life is precious to our God. And anytime someone is murdered, whether in the womb or outside the womb, our God is deeply offended by that. And he calls for the consequence to meet the crime. And so here's the point, as he points out, the murderer, his own life becomes forfeit because of the high crime of what he has done. And so the point is this, After the flood and the consequence of violence violence that had filled the earth, God now requires capital punishment in order to limit the spread of violence. Now, thirdly then, notice how he restarts creation with a covenant. And this is so beautiful. We know the story well about with the rainbow, but let's begin, first of all, who is in this covenant? Notice this is everyone. Look at verses 8 and 10. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, I now establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you and with every living creature that is that was with you the birds the livestock and all the wild animals all those that came out of the ark with you every living creature on the earth now we noted already before that covenants are like a marriage it's a relationship sealed and bound by vows where both parties are bound by what they promised to do and once again God extends his covenant with Noah and notice who's a recipient now God says, it's not just you, Noah. It's not just your family, Noah, but it's all the animals. This is the widest covenant God has given. This is God's, as it were, covenant with all creation. 
God looks at the plants. He looks at the animals. And God now says, I am establishing a relationship with you as your creator to have an everlasting and ongoing covenant relationship with you. And so we see here that Noah and his descendants and every living creature now are in a bound relationship with God as creator. Now, what is the promise? Look at verse 11. This is what God is binding himself to. He says, I established my covenant with you. Never again will all life be cut off by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. In other words, on the other side of the flood, God is saying to all creation, I, as your creator, am vowing, I am binding myself to this oath. There will never be a worldwide flood as you witness. There will be regional floods, but there will never be a worldwide flood. God is vowing to all creation that what he had just done, he will never do again. And I just want to highlight the graciousness of this. We saw last week that mankind still has sin. And God is saying, listen, I'm not going to do this again. This is not going to solve the problem. And I will never again wipe out everything as I have just done in the flood. In other words, there will be no flood 2.0. There's no need, there's no fear that the world will end by anything other than the coming of Christ. And he binds himself to this. And again, notice who's the recipient of this. It is both believer and unbeliever alike. It is to all the animals, God says, listen, I'm going to extend grace to you, and I'm going to promise never to wipe you out as I did before. Now, lastly, notice a picture of this covenant. Our children likely know this story well. Look at the, the sign and seal of this covenant promise. Look at verse 12. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant I'm making between me and you and every living creature with you, a covenant for all generations to come. I have set my rainbow in the clouds, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Whenever I bring clouds over the earth and the rainbow appears in the clouds, now notice who's going to remember this. Verse 15, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all the living creatures of every kind. Never again will the waters become a flood to destroy all life. Whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures of every kind on the earth. Now here we see, as God always does with every covenant, he gives a sign and seal, just as today we have baptism and Lord's Supper. So for this covenant, God says, the rainbow will be an everlasting testimony that I will never break my promise. Now there's great beauty in this. Just consider when a rainbow appears. I never thought about it to this week. When does a rainbow appear in the sky? It always appears when clouds have water in them. And that's significant because it was the same clouds filled with water that destroyed the whole earth. God is saying to Noah, every time you see a cloud filled with rain, do not have anxiety, do not tremble. I am vowing to you that that cloud will not produce violent wrath as they did before. You know, one commentator was playful with this. He, he wondered that if Noah was kind of like our children when a storm would happen. You know, he, he saw the worst storm possible. Did Noah ever see thunder and lightning begin to tremble? Is God judging us again? Well, see, he could look at the, the rainbow and say, no, God had promised. God had vowed that he will never do this again, and I am trusting and believing in that. And even more than that, there's significance to the rainbow as well. Literally in the Hebrew, by the way, it's not rainbow, Literally, it's just simply bow. It is the same word in Hebrew for the battle bow, the weapon of war that kings would take into battle to defeat their foe. And almost certainly what God is showing through the rainbow is that he's hung up his weapon of war. God says, I made war on this earth. I showed my violence and my wrath upon just, or just wrath upon sinful creation. But listen, I'm hanging up my bow. I will no longer show war and violence against creation as I have done before. In fact, actually, my teacher in college even argued that the symbolism is, is even more significant because the arc of a rainbow, what is the direction of the arrow? He argued that it's pointed towards heaven. In other words, it's a promise, he argued, of the gospel. Who is God going to make war on instead of us sinful people who deserve it? It's his son. Who is going to be the one to have the wrath of God's anger poured upon him? It's his only begotten son on the cross 2,000 years ago. You see, that's exactly what the Noahic Covenant is all about. God is driving home that you and I will never solve our sin problem. In fact, I think even more, God is showing that wrath and even warnings of wrath will never keep you and me from sinning again. 
God could warn over and over that he will punish with the flood and sinful men and women, because we have sin in our hearts, it's what we desire to do, will still break God's law. And so God says, I have to draw, I have to make the fix. I will send my son. He will die and I will pour upon him all of my wrath that was due my people and he will redeem a people for himself. And so here's the point. How do we see the gospel here? Well, one, we see it that God required his son to pour out his own lifeblood. He was the only innocent man who had ever lived and he was betrayed uh, by guilty sinners and hung on the cross on our behalf. Uh, The other way, way we see it is that he rose again from the dead. Just as Noah, as it were, came out of the ark on the other side to bring renewal, so when Christ rose from the dead as the second Noah brought about the establishment of the full and ultimate renewal. And lastly, I think this is so beautiful. The reason that the rainbow points to Christ is because it's our assurance that God will not punish us. Just as Noah could see that God would always see the rainbow. Isn't that remarkable? Isn't it interesting that the rainbow is not for us, it's for God? God is saying, how do you know I'm not going to forget what I promise? It's because I'm going to see the rainbow. Christian, this morning, how do you know God's not going to forget that he saved you? How are you assured this day that God's not going to forget that you are one of his own? The answer is Christ is seated now at the right hand of God. He is our rainbow. So that every time God looks at his son, he sees the marks on his hands, the marks on his feet, and he sees the everlasting testimony, as Hebrews says. You paid for the sins of my people. Believers this morning, Christ sits at the right hand of God so you and I would have absolute assurance that when we sin, when we run unto him in in repentance looking for forgiveness, we are sure God will not judge us because Christ has bore that in our place. He bears the marks at the right hand of the Father. Do you know that this morning? Can you, like Noah, rest in the assurance that God's wrath will never come upon you because Christ has done that? Oh, Christian, that is the joy, again, of being a believer. Knowing what Christ has done is sure, and God will never forget. Well, in conclusion then, what are some thoughts of application as always? And I just have two brief things I want to leave you with. First of all, it teaches us from the text, if I can put it this way, of the seriousness of murder. Uh, To this day, the seriousness of murder is still seen, and that raises a question. And I just want to answer this question as best I can. Is the capital punishment requirement still in play? In other words, maybe to put the question this way, is there biblical warrant to say that God still requires capital punishment because of the seriousness of murder? And with all humility, let me just make the case, yes, absolutely. I think the Bible makes very clear that this requirement has never been taken away. First of all, think about this. God's covenant with Noah is a covenant that's still in play today. This is a covenant that is still in play until Christ comes back and God has never taken back the requirement for capital punishment. Secondly, let me make the case again. In Romans 13, Paul says in the new covenant that God has given the sword to the government, if you look that text up, to punish the wrath of God on evildoers. And so I would make the case that God has given now the sword to the government to punish as his instrument of wrath evildoers. And I would caveat it with this. God makes very clear that this is only done through strict requirements and making sure just trial. If you read through the Mosaic Law, it was case after case of making sure that an unfair trial never takes place. And so to say this does not mean that unfair trials and unjust trials happen. Those things are important to God. But what I would say is this. God never changes. Murder is still offensive to him. And I would argue on the weight of the Bible that this still is in play. And let me just end with this. I know this is a difficult topic that raises many questions, and Christians can debate this, but I would just say the weight of Scripture leans and clearly shows that God still hates murder and requires the full extent of punishment. Again, I leave you to your Bibles to weigh that. But secondly, and I want to end with this, all that we've seen in this wants to teach us the character of our God is goodness. After he wipes out the world with a flood, on the other side, once again, God wants to remind us of who he is. He is a good God. How do we see that here? Well, we see that because he makes a covenant with the animals. Think of that. God loves the animals. God cares for his creation. And even more than that, God makes a covenant with all people, even unbelievers. Isn't that interesting? 
Uh, an unbeliever who doesn't acknowledge God is in a covenant relationship with God whether he wants to admit it or not. Uh, this is what theologians call common grace, where God gives common grace even to unbelievers. What's the point? Behold the character of our God. He is a patient God filled with long-suffering grace and mercy, and he protects and provides for life even upon a sinful world that does not acknowledge him. And let me just end with this. This last week, we have seen the violence of fallen man, haven't we? Think about the bombing that ha- took the lives of 13 servicemen and countless Afghans. That is abhorrent to God, to see his creation doing that to one another. Even more than that, we're witnessing the violence and the terror that the Taliban are doing. And here's the point, God is watching. And God hates those things. And listen, those things will not go unpunished. God makes very clear to those who do not repent and do not place their trust in Christ, judgment day is coming. So Christians, as we come to texts like this, we are the ones with great hope. Even as you and I perhaps felt felt with despair this week at what is taking place in this world, God is watching. God cares. And judgment day will come. And God will avenge the murder of all those people in this earth that has taken place. Believer, we have a good God and he cares for his people. Amen. Let's pray. Our great God and our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. Father, we pray that as we go from here, apply your word now to all of our hearts. Father, we stand in need of encouragement. We stand in need of correction. We stand in need of your grace. And so, Father, grant unto us what we need through your living word. We ask this in Christ's name alone. Amen.